Acts 27. You'll remember uh, the Apostle Paul has uh, been arrested. In earlier chapters, he has been put on trial. He's been before two governors, Governor Felix, Governor Festus, and uh, even before King, uh, King Agrippa. And uh, now he has been sent to Rome to appear before Caesar. And so chapter 27 is, uh, covers their traveling from uh, where they are to all the way to Rome, Italy. And, uh, and so all, as they're making the voyage, a great storm moves in. Verse number 14, we'll start reading there. Verse 14, but not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship. And fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strake sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. How many of you can say, man, that you've been in a storm that just seemed to move you? I mean, it just moved you. It moved your mind. It moved your marriage. It moved your your life. It moved your emotions. It moved you. And they're in a storm that's moving them. They're exceedingly tossed with a tempest. Verse 19, And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved, was then taken away. Verse 21 will be our text this morning. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete. So I'm going to preach on I told you so this morning. I'm just kidding, I'm not really. He said, you should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete. Here's our text and to have gained this harm and loss. And to have gained this harm and loss. Would you read that out loud together with me? And to have gained this harm and loss. By the help of the Lord, I want to preach to you this morning on the gain of harm and loss. The gain of harm and loss. Pray with me and for me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Word of God. Thank you for church. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for all the things you've done in my life. Lord, I want to give you thanks right now and praise and honor and glory for what you've done in me and for me. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my heritage. Thank you for the blessings you've given in my life. Thank you for this church to be a part of. Thank you for this Bible that you've given to me. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for saving a preacher's kid. (laughs) Thank you for saving a kid that heard it way too many times. I finally got saved when I was 18. Thank you for your long suffering and your patience. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you for what you've done in this church. Thank you for what you've done last Sunday night as we ordained three men to be deacons in this family. Thank you for what you've done in their life. Thank you for what you've done at 160 Springdale Road. Lord, thank you for all your blessings. Lord, I pray this morning as we work through this passage of Scripture, God, I pray that you will open it up to our hearts and minds. Lord, I pray the Bible and the Word will be, a, will be sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing us under the soul and spirit. God, I pray you will get down to the root of the matter this morning. Lord, give us strength where we are the weakest. Give us healing where we are the most broken. Give us wisdom where we are the most confused. Give us light where it is the darkest. Lord, I pray you'll speak to us. We stand in great need. 2018, God's people stand in great need. Families stand in great need. Churches stand in great need. Marriages stand in great need. Lord, would you give us what we need this morning? Lord, as we pray, we want what we need. There are things we would like to see. There are things that our flesh would want to happen in church. But God, I ask you that uh, you just give us what we need. And we want that. We want what we need this morning. If we need to be corrected, correct us. If we need to be chastened, chasten us. If we need to be rebuked, rebuke us. If we need to be encouraged, encourage us. If we need a promise, give us a promise. God, we want what we need and speak to us. Do your work in that which only you can. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. 
And after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. One of the things that God gives the 276 men on that ship in the middle of Eurachlodon was a, was a point where everything fell apart. From, they, they can trace it all the way back to one point. It's verse number 11. Paul said, I told you not to do this. I told you we shouldn't go. But so the centurion Julius didn't believe him, didn't, didn't trust him. He, he believed the word of the master and owner of the ship more than that which of, what, what Paul said. And God gives them a point to say, everything fell apart for you right there. You should have listened. And I don't know about you, but God has done that to me many times. He has said, you're in a bad mess right now, and it's because of what happened some time ago with this right here. He gives me a point of reference to look back to to say, man, I was doing good up until I did that. I was doing good up until I crossed that line. I was doing right up in, anybody in here with me this morning? I was doing good until I, I broke that rule or I ignored that Bible verse or I committed that sin. He gives me a point of reference, a point where everything kind of began to fall apart. And I could trace my life back to some points where I've made some mistakes and had to pay for it. So Paul gives them a divine, I told you so, but then he says, we've gained this harm and loss. Now, these men are in the absolute worst storm of their lives. They are in a horrible situation. And it would seem impossible to find something good in the middle of something so bad. It would seem impossible to find something good in the middle of something so bad. And there are times in life where it gets so bad, you can't find something good with a magnifying glass and a telescope and the FBI. And God help that person that comes up and says, you know, well, hey, you know, at least you're an American still. Or, hey, at least you're still saved. Thank you, Captain Spiritual. <laughs> yes, I'm saved. My house just burned down. <laughs> I'm in a problem. And in my flesh, I can't see anything good. I remember when I was in college, a, a preacher friend of mine, uh, their house burned down, and they lost everything they had, every suit, every pair of shoes, all their money, all of his books, his Bibles, his notes, everything his wife had, all their pictures from their, uh, from their life together. I mean, they were, they were a, a little bit older, and their kids were already grown, and they just, they just lost everything, and they were devastated. And uh, I was in class one morning in one of my preacher's class, and and I, and I requested prayer. I said, pray for preacher so-and-so. Their house burned down last night, and they lost everything they had. And that, that teacher said, no, no, they didn't. They still got Jesus. Anybody else got a prayer request? And I thought, you jerk. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they still got Jesus, but they ain't got nowhere to sleep. They just lost everything they had. You know, have some compassion. And when we're in a really bad spot, sometimes it's almost impossible to find something to be thankful about. Some of you probably had a real hard time with the exercise in the choir this morning of go find five things that you're thankful for. And sometimes when our heart's broken and when we're in a, a Eurachlodon storm, our wisdom and our clarity of mind is gone and we have a hard time finding something good in the middle of something so bad. Those of you that have been through a Eurachlodon storm understand exactly what I'm talking about. Think about Miss Tammy getting the phone call about having cancer. Hard to find something good in something so bad as cancer, right? It's hard to find something to praise God over when everything around you is falling apart. And when Eurachlodon has set in on top of us, it's hard to find something good in the middle of something so bad. I'll need a good amen right here, though. But God can bring a good thing from a bad place. God can bring a good thing from a bad place. He can bring a good thing from a bad person. He can bring a good thing from a bad event. He can bring a good thing from a bad place. Your Bible is filled with testimony after testimony after testimony of God bringing good things out of bad places. 
I think about the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. You all know the story. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said unto him, Father, give me the portion of the goods that falleth unto me. So he divided unto them his living, and he took his journey into a far country. Y'all remember that story? Say amen. And, there, and when he had spent all, there arose a, a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with a husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And he came to himself and he said, How many of my hired servants of my fathers have bread enough in despair, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. He was a great way off. And his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. But the father said to his hired servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and bring hither a, a ring and put it on him and shoes on his feet and bring forth the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and make merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. You know what happened? The prodigal son left the good place, father's house, went to a bad place, far country, ended up in a worse place, the, the hog pen, to learn something good about the father's house. He couldn't learn it when he was there. He didn't learn it, how good it was when he was with his daddy, but he figured it out in the hog pen, about to eat the husk that the swine did eat. You know what the husk is, don't you? It's that, it's that thing on the lobby back there, in the, up against that wall. It's not even edible. You can't even make salad with corn husks. Don't get much worse than the hog pen. But in that hog pen is where he came to himself. In that hog pen is where he came to himself. In that, this is what he came to, Brother Charles. You know what he came to? He came to what was in there before. He came to who? Himself. He came to what the Father had put in him. <laughs> he came to what the Father had put in him. And he realized, that's what I needed all along. I had to go all the way and lose everything I had and find myself in the middle of a hog pen to gain this, this knowledge that what Daddy gave me was the best I already had. Prodigal son. I think about Abraham and Isaac, Genesis 22. Talking about God bringing a good thing from a bad place. Talking about God bringing gain from harm and loss. I think about Abraham and Isaac, Genesis 22. You know, you know the story, God told Isaac or Abraham to offer Isaac. You know, Old Testament altar is a really good thing, unless you've got to lay on it. But if you've got to lay on that altar, that's a bad thing, because that means you're going to die. Anything lays on the altar in the Old Testament died. Nothing survived. And God told Isaac and Abraham, Isaac, lay on it. Lay on that altar. He's grown. I mean, he's a teenager. Big enough to handle his old daddy, physically speaking. Isaac had to lay on that altar. Abraham had that knife about to finish the job. And God spoke from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, lay not thine hand upon the lad. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And you all know the rest of the account. They went and got that ram, and that ram died in his place. That ram, an obvious and clear prophecy picture of the Son of God. Called in, the, called in the curse. Called in the, the curse. The curse was briars and thorns. He's called in that curse. It's wrapped around his head. One preacher said it was wrapped around the horns of that ram because if it had wrapped around his leg, he'd have been cut. He'd have had a blemish. He would not have been a legal sacrifice. But it was wrapped around the, the horns. You can't scratch a horn. And so that horn, that, that ram went and laid down a spotless, perfect, blemish-free sacrifice just like the Son of God would a few thousand years later. But Isaac had to go to a bad place to learn what it meant to be replaced. God can bring a good thing from a bad place. I think about the 12 disciples in Mark chapter number 4. They get in that storm. Jesus is in the boat, the hinder part of the ship asleep. And then that boat's about to sink. And they wake him up and say, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And Jesus got up and with the word of his mouth said, Peace be still. He rebuked the wind and the storm was calm and the disciples marveled saying, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the seas obey his voice? They had to go to a bad place, a storm, to learn a good thing about Christ. 
Those same 12 disciples, two chapters later in Mark chapter 6, get in another boat, this time without Jesus, and go on the same sea, but now they're in a storm, and they're going down and they're afraid, and here comes Jesus walking on the water. So they had to go to another bad place to get another good thing, to find out that Jesus cannot just calm the storm, he can walk on the water. Man, he was proving how God he was. Anyone that has a problem understanding that Jesus Christ was God has never read their Bible. Anyone that has a problem understanding that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh has never read their Bible. He did things only God can do. Thank you. He did things only God can do. I remember in, I think it's uh, Mark chapter number 2, uh, Jesus is in a house and man, there's a whole lot of people in there and no one can get in. And there was a man of the palsy, born of four. These, these four men had him on a bed and they couldn't get him in the house so they, so they peeled back the ceiling tiles and they let him down through the roof. And, and the very first thing Jesus said, he said, sons, thy sins be forgiven thee. Man, they freaked out. They said, who can forgive sins but God only? Amen. And he said, so that you can know that I am God and have power to forgive sins, son, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed and walk. And a man of palsy, with palsy, got up and walked out with his sins forgiven and his body fixed because Jesus was God. Amen. Jesus was God. Listen, around here we believe with everything in us that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And look, I know people choke on it. I know people fight about it. I know whole denominations have started because of that argument right there that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. But I tell you without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. You say, yeah, but the other manuscripts don't say God. They say He. Yeah, you're right. Eight of them say He. 306 say God. So you want to talk about manuscript evidence, talk about that manuscript evidence. Just because there was one manuscript that said he doesn't take away the 308 that said Theos, God. Amen. That was free, Brother Wayne. Free. So God can bring a bad thing from a, a good thing from a bad place. What about Joseph? Genesis 37. He left the best place. He was his father's favorite. He didn't even have to work for a living. The other brothers had to do that. He just went and checked on them. He was the superintendent, so to speak. He drove the F-350 around and made phone calls. He goes out there to check on his brothers. You know, he has those dreams. You're going you're to be the ruler and everyone's going to bow down to you. He had those dreams. You know what he had to do to see that happen? He had to go to Egypt as a slave. That's bad. But then bad got worse. Then he had to go to jail for something he didn't do. Amen. He had to go to jail for something he didn't do. But it was in that prison that the butler and the baker had a dream. And Joseph interpreted those dreams. And that right there led to the best thing in Joseph's life. The next thing you know, he's the governor of the land. He's got the plan for the famine. And here comes his brothers. And here comes his daddy. And God had brought a good thing from a bad place. So I'm trying to tell you that God can bring gain from harm, from loss. And if you live long enough, you know I'm telling you the truth, that life is filled with Eurachlodon storms, and life is filled with harm, and life is filled with loss. You lose things. You lose part of yourself. You lose part of your mind. You lose your energy. You lose your... Sometimes some of you need lost faith. Some of you are looking at me like I'm some kind of stark raving lunatic. You think I'm crazy. You think I'm crazy for, for crying and for hollering and shouting and raising my hand. You think Brother William's crazy for saying, that's good, that's good. You think Brother William's crazy. You think these ladies are nuts for, for coming to the altar and praying. You think they're crazy. You know why? Because something's happened in your life. You've gone through a Eurachlodon storm. You faced harm and you faced loss and it took something from your faith. It took something from you. We go through seasons Storms, we experience harm and loss. But I want to tell you from God's word, God can bring something good out of that. and You can gain. God can add something to you. He can increase your faith. He can increase your capacity. He can increase your joy. He can increase your faith. He can increase your happiness. He can increase your family. He can increase you through harm and loss. So Acts 27, what was gained from harm and loss. What was gained? Well, you in Acts 27? I want to show you three things they gained. First thing they gained was clarity in 
our problems. They gain clarity in our problems. This is a, this is a ship that is not a Christian ship. This was not the gospel cruise. Joe Arthur's not on this boat. The Gaithers are not singing on this boat. This is a wheat ship headed to Rome, Italy, and it's got a whole bunch of prisoners on it. This is not a church bus. This is not a church boat. This is not even the love boat. This is the sin boat. This is not a Christian trip. I'm saying that to say this, that the men on board this boat outside of Paul and Luke and whoever else was with them are not preachers. It's not a Sunday school trip. They're not, they're not loading up to go eat at the, uh, 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 over the ridge, top of the ridge, or whatever that seafood place is we like to go to. This is not a church trip. This is a boat full of a bunch of lost people. And if at any time you stopped them and said, hey, dude, what's the biggest problem in your life? If at any time during Acts 27 you stopped them and said, hey, man, what's the biggest problem in your life? They're going to look at you like you're an idiot, and then they're going to say, no, duh, it's this storm. It's this boat that's falling apart. I'm like, I'm, I'm watching it come undone under my feet, and we're going to die in this sea. The biggest problem I got is we can't see the sun, we can't see the stars, and, and, and we're going to die out here in this storm. That's what they would say. And humanly speaking, they'd be right. They say, what's your greatest need? Dry land. A dock. You know, solid ground. We, Brother William was talking about in Sunday school this morning about uh, that Hurricane Michael that hit Mexico Beach and all the houses were destroyed, but there was one house that had uh, built their foundation, their footings were 40 foot deep. Y'all know what a footing is? That, that, that's a big old ditch dug under your house and they fill it with concrete and then you build your house on that, on that concrete. And they dug those footings 40 foot deep and drove the rebar from the bottom of that thing all the way to the top of the house. So when that hurricane came in, it didn't knock it over. It's still standing. So if you're saying, if you're in a storm, thinking, man, what's my greatest need? 40-foot footings. That's my greatest need. <laughs> I need 40-foot footings. Well, I need solid ground. I need out of this storm. All right? What if God gave them that right off the bat? What if Jesus stepped on that boat? What if he gave Paul the apostolic power to do exactly what he did and say, peace be still? And the wind stopped. And they all made it to a shore and went on and lived their lives and died and went straight to hell. That storm wasn't their biggest problem. Their biggest problem was they didn't know God. Their biggest problem wasn't Eurachlodon. Their biggest problem was they were grown men, half their life was over, and they didn't know God yet. That was their biggest problem. Their biggest problem was whether they die sinking in a boat or whether they die sitting on the beach with a drink in their hand, when they died they were going to hell. Because they didn't know God. That was their biggest problem. I want to tell you this morning, friend, your biggest problem is not your Don. Your biggest problem is you don't know God. What, what good is it to gain the whole world and lose your own soul? What good is it to, to have an easy life and not have a Eurachlodon, but then die without God? What good is it to be that Luke 16 rich man, to die with money and wealth and, and a big house and a closet full of nice clothes and luxury, but then to die and lift up your eyes in the lake of fire? Your greatest problem is not money. Your greatest problem is not clothes. Your greatest problem is not your vehicle. Your greatest problem is not your, not your finances. It's not your health. Your biggest problem is you need God. Need God. And in the middle of Eurachlodon, the Apostle Paul stood up and said, I believe God. And he began to tell them about God. They finally got to land where Paul could teach them about God. And they learned what their biggest problem was. They only learned that in the storm. I only learned that in the storm. My son, I'll pray for him. He has the greatest life of any five-year-old in the whole world. Any five-year-old in the whole world. I mean, I... He's got a better life than Donald Trump's grandkids, I'm telling you. You know what? A lot of times he gets so frustrated. He gets so ill. You know, if, if there's no more goldfish, he gets so frustrated. I'll tell you, he gets, he gets real frustrated. This is his first world problem. If the Internet's not working fast enough and he can't watch Dirty and Stinky or Stinky and Dirty or whatever that show's called, the dump truck and the, and the trash truck, y'all know that show? Oh, he gets frustrated. Oh, he gets that all from her, I'm telling you. He gets that from her. 
Right now, at five years old, you say, son, what's your greatest problem? My internet's not fast enough. The goldfish box, they can't make a box big enough. Brother James brought them home some the other day. I promise you, they're the size of that chair. That carton's this tall, won't even fit in the cabinet. They ain't gonna, it'll run out. You know what he'll do? Oh, my goldfish are gone. They can't make a box, they can't make a box big enough for them. They come back in 20 years when he's got a bad report from his doctor or if he just had a big fight with his wife and she just walked out or his son's maybe in, in an accident. Come back later and ask him what his biggest problem is. Come back later when he realizes he's lost and he knows he, knows he needs God. Ask him, what's your biggest problem? It's going to be, I need God to do something for me. I need God. We gain clarity in our problems through these harm and losses that we go through. It teaches us what we really need. It tells us what's really important. We gain clarity in our problems. Secondly, verse number 9, if you'll look at it, sailing was now dangerous. And Paul admonished them in verse 10, Sirs, I perceive this voyage will be with much hurt and much damage, not only the lading of the ship, but also of our lives. Say the next word out loud. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things spoken by Paul. Verse number 21, our text, he said, Ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, who gained his harm and loss. He said, You should have listened to me. Now look in verse number, let's see, verse number 24. Paul says that God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. That's what God told Paul. That God hath given him all that sail with thee. He said, Sirs, be of good cheer. I believe, God, that it shall be even as it was told me. All right, look at verse number 30. Verse 30, you there? And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color, as though they would have cast out anchors of the fore ship. So these guys are sneaking out. They are sneaking out of the big ship, putting a dinghy boat in the water, going to try to get off on their own. So Paul says in verse 31, Paul said to the centurion of the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. Verse uh, 33, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God and presented them all. And when he had broken, he began to eat. And, and then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. You know what they got out of this storm? They didn't just gain clarity in their problems. They gained confidence in their preacher. They gained confidence in their preacher. Now, y'all don't be nervous. I ain't talking about me, so y'all don't be nervous. But they gained confidence in their preacher. You know what we find out in the beginning? They'll listen to it. They'll hear him. But his opinion only means so much. If somebody with a boat says it says so, somebody with some secular experience says so, they're going to believe that person. They're going to believe secular experience over God's wisdom. That's what they're going to believe. So they didn't listen to him. Well, then they really messed up. Point of reference. Everything fell off the hinges when you didn't listen to the preacher. All Paul told them is what God told him. So everything fell apart when you didn't listen to what God said. That was the point of reference we started with. And so now, now they didn't listen the first time. Well, they've learned their lesson. So now when Paul says, hey, if you get out of this ship, you're not going to make it. So the soldiers cut the ropes off. They listened. They believed him. But they cut the ropes off, let the boat fall off and just go off into oblivion. It's gone. Then he says, hey, y'all need to eat. Y'all haven't eaten in 14 days. Y'all need to eat some bread. So you know what they did? They let the preacher say the blessing, let the preacher eat first, and then they ate. <laughs> they believed him. They learned to trust what the man of God said. They learned to trust that God's speaking to him, and he's telling us what God told him. That's what he said. I believe that it shall be even as it was told me. Amen. They learned to have confidence in their preacher, and they believed him. They believed him. They believed God's word. And you know what's sad? So sad. So many times God has to break us down to get us ready to listen to God's word. God has to break us down. He has to let Eurachlodon come raging into life. 
and move us and throw us around so that we can listen to God's word. Friend, I'm going to make a bold statement. Your Uncle Don may be tearing things up in your life, but if it's taught you how to listen to God's word, that's the best blessing God's ever given you. If it's taught you how to listen to God's word, it's the best blessing God's ever given you. If it's, to, if it's taught you how to listen to God's word, it's the best blessing God's ever given you. It may be harm, it may be loss, it may not be comfortable, but God has given you something whereby you can learn to trust God's word. And it's a blessing. I gave, look, verse number, verse number 30. Are you looking at it? Look at it with me. And as the who? Shipmen were about to flee out of the ship. They let down the boat into the sea under color. First thing, they're in a ship. There's 276 people on board according to verse number 37. That's a pretty good sized boat. It's a pretty good sized boat. And there's tackling and there's wheat, there's cargo. It's a pretty big boat. But they think they're going to do better in a dinghy boat. They're going to get out of the ship and get in a John boat. They're going to get out of a ship and get in a John boat and row. It ain't because they have more confidence in the John boat than the ship. But if they have more confidence in themselves, it's overconfidence in self. You think you're going to do better on your own? You think you're going to jump ship and get out, of the, get out of the life of the people that God puts you with? You think you'll do better on your own, friend? That's overconfidence in self. You think you're going to row that storm on your own? You think you and your John boat are going to stay afloat and you can run off and do it your own way? I don't think so. That's overconfidence in self. All right, so who was getting out of the boat or the ship? The shipman. All right, then Paul speaks up in verse 31. Except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the who? Soldiers. The soldiers cut off the ropes. You see, I don't know, Brother Wayne, that the shipmen ever believed what Paul said. Because they didn't cut the ropes off. The soldiers did. The shipmen may or may not have believed. But the soldiers believed it for them. They said, fine, we'll cut the ropes off. They cut off their way of escape. All right, here's my thought. Your kids may not believe you really need to go to church. Your kids may not really believe they need the Bible. Somebody better believe it for them. Your family may not even think you really need to be in church. You may not need to come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and then five nights of Jubilee, God help us. Your, your wife may not think you need all that. Somebody in your house better believe it. Right. Your kids may not think they need to go to Sunday school, but somebody in their house better believe it. They may not think they need church or they need to read their Bible at night before they go to bed. They don't need to pray before they go to bed. Somebody in the house better believe it. If the shipmen want the soldiers better, the shipmen didn't ever cut the boat loose. The soldiers did. You know what I want to give thanks to God for this morning? I'm going to thank God that when I didn't believe Him, my daddy did. There's too many households that are spiritually ruled by the youngest person in them. There's too many kids making the spiritual decisions on do we go to church, where do we go to church, how long do we stay at church, how often do we go to church. Do, hey, you all in here this morning? I'm not trying to make you mad. I told you we want what we need. The soldiers cut the ropes, not the shipmen. That, that may have made the shipmen mad as fire. That might, I mean, it might have made them so mad. It wasn't the soldier's boat, it was the shipmen's boat. Uh -huh. Somebody better be willing to lose a boat to save the men. Somebody better be willing to lose a boat to save the men. Then shipmen probably got mad when they cut that boat loose. And they didn't understand but when they made it to land and weren't dead, they'd have been appreciative. You say, you don't understand. My son just has to get that extra sleep. It may make him mad now, but when he's 30 and he's not dead and he's married and he's got a family and he's in church and God's blessing him, he'll be thankful for it. 
But my son, just my daughter just really wants to go to that party. And I just, I just can't bring myself to say no. Ma'am, you better learn to say no. You better learn to believe it even when they don't. You better learn to believe when the shipmen don't. And when they're older and they're not ruined and they've not made shipwreck, they'll appreciate it. My daddy was hard on me. My dad, I, I was a pastor's kid. You know what that means? I didn't even get to do things a lot of church kids got to do. I got in trouble for things church kids didn't get in trouble for. Miss Tammy was there. She witnessed every bit of it. I got spankings when her son didn't. <laughs> Amen. I did. Brother John was a preacher's kid. He knows what it's all about. You know what? I'm sure I'm thankful. Amen. My daddy believed even when I didn't. That's right. And he was willing to cut a boat loose yep. and cut off my way of escape. Sure, I'm thankful for that. Sure, I'm thankful. Those storms, well, I got way far off, didn't I? Them storms, they give us confidence in our preacher if it teaches how to listen. He just how to listen. And if this storm in your life has taught you how to listen to God's word, then that storm's a gift. That harm and loss is a gift if it's taught you how to listen to God's word. Sometimes we have a hard time giving thanks for that stuff. But if it's taught us how to, how to read our Bible, not just how to read it, but how to believe it. Paul believed it. He said, I believe that it shall be even as it was told me. Man, give us some Christians like that. Give us some faith like that, that can believe God's word just like it was told. Y'all got time for one more? They got clarity in their problems. Confidence in their preacher. All right, look, verse number three. Verse number one. 27 verse 1. <clears throat> the very last little phrase. They get into a boat or a ship, and the man in charge is Julius, the centurion. Verse number 3. The next day we touched at Sidon, so they land, so they, they dock somewhere, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go into his friends to refresh himself. So the centurion, the boss, He's being nice to Paul. He's being cordial. He's being polite to Paul. Verse number 9 and 10, Paul tells him, hey, we don't need to take this trip. Verse number 11, the centurion doesn't believe him. He just passes right over him. Paul told him not to go, but his opinion only meant so much. He's polite, he's cordial, he's courteous, but their relationship only goes so far. You don't trust him. So he passes over him. All right, then the storm comes in. Now they're all fearing for their life, thinking they're all going to die. And verse number 43, as the ship's been broken off in half, verse 42, the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, which Paul was one of, let any, lest any of them escape and should swim out. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose. So now we find them protecting Paul. He was polite to Paul, but then he passed over Paul. But now he's protecting Paul. <coughs> and in chapter number 28, when they finally get where they're going, in verse number 16, when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with the soldier that kept him. Now he's showing partiality to Paul, flat-out favoritism. He's not even sending Paul with the rest of the prisoners. You know what's happened? He's not just gained clarity in our problems. He's not just gained confidence in the preacher. He's gained closeness to some people. And that storm, Eurachlodon, it pushed Julius and Paul closer together. At the end of it, Julius wouldn't dare send Paul in with the rest of those prisoners. He's got him off by himself. Special treatment, favoritism. Why? Because they've gotten close. The storm drove them close. Eurachlodon, the harm and loss, it drove them closer together. And I wonder in your life, you're in Eurachlodon right now, I wonder who it is God's trying to drive you closer to. I wonder who it is God's trying to draw, drive you closer to through harm and loss. Nothing bonds in a relationship like trouble. There's a whole lot of marriages make it through loss of a child. There's a whole lot of marriages that'll make it through a house burning down. There's a whole lot of marriages that'll make it through a, a career collapse. 
Very few will make it through winning that mega millions. Very few will make it through mega millions. I know half of y'all probably went and bought a ticket, didn't you? You better tithe. You better tithe. And since you didn't work for it, you better tithe 20%, not just 10. How many families have we seen driven closer together by adversity, but driven apart by fun stuff? How many marriages have we seen fall apart when they started making money and when they bought that second house or they got that boat or they got that condo or they won that lottery? They don't fall apart through, through hardships. Why? It drives them closer together. It drives them closer together. And I wonder who it is God's trying to drive you closer to. You got time for a 90-second Bible study? Turn to 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16. Miss Leslie, can you come to the piano? I know you want to do the 90-second Bible study. I'm sorry. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Y'all know what's going on? Saul is the king of Israel, but God said, you're done, Saul. You're fired. I'm giving the kingdom to, to, to your neighbor, someone better than you. 1 Samuel 16 God sends the prophet Samuel to Jesse's house. You know what his job is? Go anoint someone to be king of one of the sons of Jesse. So he gets in there. David's got his sons in there. Verse number 6. It came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab. That's the oldest. And said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. And Jesse calls the rest of his sons one by one. Verse number 10. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? Y'all know the rest of the story? He said, No, the youngest is out there watching the sheep. His daddy didn't even invite him to the party to be, to be an option to be king. Jesse didn't even think David was an option of God's. Now how about that for an insult, Brother Stephen? His own daddy didn't even think God could use him. Uh, that hurts. That stings. So David's not even included. We well, all know what happens. He comes, God anoints, uh, Samuel anoints him to be king. And then in 1 Samuel 17, Goliath showed up. And Goliath is standing in the valley of Elah, challenging Israel, saying, Send me a man, mocking God, mocking God's people. David's brothers are there at the battle. David's still watching sheep. And so Jesse, David's daddy, says, Here, here's some cheeses. Take his stuff down to your brothers. Go serve your brothers. So he goes down there to give his brothers cheeses. Cheese is in the Bible, and it's good. You're supposed to eat it. First time you find the milk in the Bible, God's drinking it. First time you find God, someone drinking milk, it's God drinking it. Genesis chapter 14. I ain't a vegan and I'm not a vegan on purpose. Because God's not. Anyway, so he gets down there and he hears Goliath cussing, blaspheming. And Goliath says, man, who's going to take care of this? So David says, if y'all want, I will. He's been down there 40 days. I'll go take care of it. Look what his brother said to him. Look what his oldest brother, Eliab. Still a little bit bitter from being refused by God. Verse 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down thither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. David's oldest brother begins to make fun of him and mock him. I wouldn't say that's pretty close. Well, then you know the rest of the story. David kills Goliath. By the power of God. Amen. So he kills Goliath. Verse chapter number 18. Now David's a hero. And the girls are writing songs about him. The girls are writing songs about him. Brother Bo knows all about that, don't you? Look what they sing. Look what they sing in chapter 18, verse number 7. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David is ten thousands. David's a hero. David's on top of the world. Now Saul becomes his enemy. Look in, look in verse number 28. 
And Saul knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was yet the more afraid of David. And Saul became David's enemy continually. A little bit of things rock on. It comes out that uh, Saul does want to kill David. Saul's oldest son, Jonathan, David's best friend, is trying to uh, uh, be the mediator. And trying to, I know uh, this is more than 90 seconds, I'm sorry. David, Jonathan's trying to fix it. He's trying to undo it, trying to talk his daddy out of killing David. For a little bit, he succeeds. But then it gets to a point where Saul is so mad, he even throws a javelin at Saul, I mean at Jonathan, for disagreeing. So Jonathan goes to David and says, David, you better run. You better run for your life. So 1 Samuel 22, 1 Samuel 22, David's on the run from Saul. The Bible says he's in a cave called a duel. He's in the cave of a duel on the run. Not a good situation. He's not the hero. If they're still singing his song, he can't hear them. He's on the run because the king wants him dead. 1 Samuel 22, verse 1, David therefore departed thence and escaped to a cave of Dulam. And when his who? Brethren and all his who? Father's house heard it. They went down thither to him. The next few verses say they made David their captain. The same daddy who six chapters ago didn't think God could even use the boy, the same brothers that made fun of him and mocked him and didn't respect him a few chapters ago now are going into a cave saying, David, you be our captain, you be our king, you be our leader, you be our boss, we'll do whatever you say. Some of David's own brothers even became David's mighty men and they began to follow David and be loyal to David and through the harm and loss of King Saul, they were driven close to David. They didn't want to have nothing to do with him before. But because of Saul, and because now David's being hunted like a dog, trouble drew that family closer together. How about that? They didn't come to David when they were, he was the hero. They didn't come put him on their shoulders and carry him off the field like some football star. When the girls were singing his praises and singing his song, they didn't come pat him on the back and say, David, do it, tell, tell us what to do. We'll, we'll do whatever. You be the captain. No. They came when he was in a cave running for his life because a storm drove them closer together. Saul may have lost, uh, David may have lost his king, but he gained his family. He went through some harm. He even told Saul later on, you've hunted me as a dog. And David had to live out in the woods, but he gained his brethren. And I wonder what kind of harm and loss you're experiencing right now, but God is trying to draw you closer to somebody and draw someone closer to you. That's the game of harm and loss. I wonder if there's a marriage in here. If there's a marriage in here that God's trying to push you closer together through a storm. This church, I think God wants to compress us. I know we want to branch out and get big. But we got to Get pushed together first. We got to get pushed together first. It's the gain of harm and loss. Let's stand on our feet. It's the gain of harm and loss. We'll gain clarity in our problems. We'll gain confidence in our preacher. And we'll gain closeness to people. It's the gain of harm and loss.